Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to receive the world's first international medical podcast, hosted by three paramedics from different countries. Live from the UK, Finland and Australia, this is Group Call. And a very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. It is 7 o'clock um, in the morning in England. It is 9 o'clock in Finland and I believe it's 4 o'clock p.m. In Australia and why I'm saying this because this is group called live uh, the first ever uh, medical podcast hosted by uh, three paramedics from different countries today's topic um, is a posterior stroke but before we'll start let me um, uh, introduce my wonderful team to you please say hello to uh, Timu, uh, Timu is on this side uh, Timu Palki from Finland Hi, 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 and Harrison uh, CD from uh, Australia. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Uh, perfect, guys. Uh, let me uh, start uh, this podcast with a quick um, case study. So, um, approximately five years ago, I was sent to the job, and due to the patient's confide- confidentiality, I cannot um, send you uh, out more details, but it was a female approximately in her 30s uh, and um, that was a concern for welfare job she basically could not stop her legs from moving uh, ops wise if you want to know everything looked uh, everything looked perfectly fine it was just that she could not stop her leg moving uh, and her legs moving uh, it looked uh, quite odd quite bizarre I must say uh, while standing, everything was fine. However, uh, in the supine position, her legs were moving from left to right as she were dancing. Um, we quite quickly excluded uh, mental health issues. We quite quickly excluded um, uh, substance abuse. So we did not really know what's going on. However, uh, she was taken to hospital for further um, examination. On the board of the truck, she arrested in VF. After one shock, she came back. Everything was as normal. We were wondering what's going on, but we could not establish what was really um, an issue there. Uh, at the hospital, as we later found out, uh, she collapsed, arrested and died. Um, sadly died. Uh, what we found out a bit later is that it was a posterior cerebral artery stroke. Um, why so weird uh, signs and symptoms? Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Harrison, uh, who I know that is ready with his um, anatomy and uh, physiology background. Harrison, over to you. Yeah, so you're right. Posterior strokes can be a little bit, um, a little bit different with the way they present compared to your typical anterior strokes. But uh, I thought we'll go over what strokes are, um, just for those that need a little bit of a refresher. So strokes, they occur when there's an interruption to cerebral perfusion, uh, which can lead to cell injury due to the decrease in the supply of the oxygen and the glucose that the brain needs. And about 87% of those strokes are ischemic in nature, so thrombolytic strokes, for example. And the other 13% um, are hemorrhagic strokes. Um, the symptoms are d- very dependent on what region of the brain is impacted and also how much collateral circulation is present to sort of support those other areas. Um, and just as you were saying, Alex, those, those sort of strange symptoms that that patient presented with, uh, with the posterior, uh, posterior stroke is what we'll go into later on. So about 80% of the brain territory is supplied by the carotid arteries. And this perfuses the anterior and the middle cerebral areas of the brain. And their responsible functions are like your motor functions, your sensory cortex, um, and most of your speech as well. And the remaining 20% of the brain territory is perfused from the vertebral arteries. So these branch off each of the subclavian arteries. They run through the upper six vertebrae through the foramen magnum. And then they join to form the basilar artery and then the posterior cerebral circulation. Um, and in the back of the brain, in the posterior brain, you've got your brainstem, your cerebellum, uh, your visual cortex, and also your um, perfusion for your visual structures as well. So that's why with posterior stroke, that's um, the areas that will be impacted. So the incidence of posterior stroke is proportional to the split between uh, the anterior and the posterior perfusion. So about 75 to 80% of strokes are considered anterior strokes. 
Uh, and they often include symptoms like the acute limb or facial weakness, uh, your aphasia, your dysarthria, and your visual deficits as well. And often those symptoms are the, the typical ones that we think of when we think of stroke. Whereas posterior strokes are a little bit more difficult. So they're the remaining roughly 20 to 25% of strokes. Uh, but the symptoms can be much more general and also non-specific, which makes them much more likely to be misdiagnosed as well. So um, just a bit of a segue for those that are interested in the cardiac side of things. Um, if you haven't read the OMI Manifesto, I highly recommend you go and do it. Um, it's a paper out by Pendle Myers, Scott Weiningart and Stephen Smith. Really, really good paper. And essentially it talks about um, for myocardial infarction, if all you're looking for is STEMI, then all you're going to find is STEMI. And there's about 25 to 30% of patients with myocardial occlusions that you're missing if you're not looking for those other signs. That's unav- 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 and unav- I see the posterior strokes as, as very similar to this as well. So if all you're looking for is anterior strokes, that's all you're going to find. Mm. So posterior strokes are often misdiagnosed, uh, which is why it's really important to, to focus on. There's around 16% of anterior strokes that are misdiagnosed. Whereas in posterior strokes, around 37% of those are misdiagnosed. And often your basic screening tools uh, that are common in the pre-hospital environment um, that paramedics and other emergency um, providers use, um, they're often more focused towards the anterior side. And in the pre-hospital environment, um, sometimes up to half of posterior strokes can be missed by these screening tools. Uh, but also this occurs in the hospital environment, in emergency departments with emergency physicians. So it's important for clinicians on all levels to keep posterior stroke in mind. So the NIHSS scale um, is used to be, uh, determine the severity of deficit in stroke, um, but this itself is weighted towards anterior stroke as well. And posterior strokes frequently um, score less than four points on the NIHSS scale, uh, which for those that don't know is a scale from zero to 42. So really, really low, um, low scores in these patients. And there's a paper published in February 2021 called The Characteristics of Patients Who Had a Stroke Not Initially Identified During Emergency Pre-Hospital Assessment, a Systematic Review. And that was by Jones et al. And that showed that the most common stroke symptoms that were missed by EMS providers were speech problems, uh, nausea and vomiting, and visual disturbances. Uh, And a study from Arch and others showed that patients with dizziness had an odds ratio of 1.99 for a missed stroke diagnosis, so they were much more likely to be missed if their primary complaint was dizziness. Um, And patients with nausea and vomiting had an odds ratio of 4.02, so four times more likely for their stroke to be misdiagnosed as another condition. So as for the symptoms of posterior stroke and how they're different to the anterior stroke. So as I said before, they can be nonspecific and sometimes quite hard to pick up, but they really resolve around the five Ds, what we call the five Ds of posterior stroke. So that includes dizziness, dysarthria, dysphagia, dysphagia, dysmetria, dysmetria, and diplopia. And diplopia. So we'll go, so we'll go, go over those, those more, more. So, more. so dizziness, dizziness is, is basically the sudden, sudden onset, onset of dizziness, dizziness or vertigo. Or vertigo. vertigo. And vertigo, vertigo is basically the sensation, sensation of movement when, when there isn't, there isn't any. Um, and often it's described as a spinning sensation, um, but it can also be described as a rocking sensation, like you're, like you're on a boat after a couple of bottles of wine. Um, it's important to distinguish the vertigo uh, that's non-positional, and also doesn't resolve. So vertigo that's triggered by movement, like rolling over in bed, um, and if that goes away after, say, about a minute or so, that's more likely to be a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Uh, But the symptoms, if they're persistent and if they're not related to movement, they're more likely to be another cause, another central cause. Um, Can be a vestibular neuritis or a labyrinthitis um, or a posterior stroke, as we're discussing now. So that's dizziness, and there's no particular... Um, waiting for these five Ds. Um, it's not like you need a score of three or so to, to be a posterior stroke. Um, but typically, most patients will present with dizziness plus one other of the following Ds. So the next one's dysarthria. So that's a slurred speech due to muscle weakness. Um, to assess this for your patient, so you get the patient to repeat a common phrase um, and assess their ability to speak clearly Um Obviously, this can be a bit difficult to assess in the intoxicated patient, um, as are all stroke syndromes as well. The next one, dysphagia, that's difficulty swallowing, and that uh, that relates to the dysarthria as well. Um, it's mostly due to that muscle weakness of the areas. The dysmetria uh, is different to muscle weakness. It's more a lack of coordination 
and proprioception, and it's also the inability to perform smooth movement, so poor hand-eye coordination, essentially. Um, that NIS, NIHSS uh, scale I mentioned earlier, they measure it in two ways. So first is the finger-to-nose test. So the clinician slowly moves their finger horizontally back and forth within the patient's field of vision, and the patient touches their nose with their finger, and then to the clinician's finger and back and forth, and that's repeated on the other side. And that's to assess the patient's um, hand-eye coordination uh, of the upper limbs. But then to the lower limbs, they do a heel-to-shin test. So what that involves is uh, the patient either seated or lying down, and the patient puts their heel of one foot onto the knee of the other foot, and they slide their heel up and down their shin in a straight motion, and then repeat that on the other side. And if the patient is unable to do one of those two assessments, they're deemed um, to have uh, dysmetrial limb ataxia. And the final D in the five Ds is diploplia, which is uh, which is double vision. So as I said before, a lot of the pre-hospital screening services um, are not suitable, uh, particularly for posterior strokes, and they often miss a lot of them. And most pre-hospital services use some sort of screening tool to quickly assess for a potential stroke. Um, and they're usually a variant of the FAST model, uh, so usually being facial weakness, arm weakness, uh, speech difficulty, and also the time, usually from last known well. Uh, there was a study from, and I'm going to butcher this name, so I'm sorry if you're listening, uh, Estima and others uh, looked at the addition of the... Agencies. So, so after, after, that, after that intervention, after they after added, they added that extra criteria, criteria um, there were um, 777 confirmed stroke, stroke patients, patients they transported, transported um, and 18% 18 18 of those were posterior, posterior strokes. And in and the paramedic assessing, the recognition, the recognition rate of posterior, posterior stroke went from 45.8% before the intervention, so about half they were missing, from 45.8% up to 74.1%. So really, really, really big improvement in the recognition of these strokes. Now, now, there's also, there's other, also services other services, that, services that are looking into um, development of other acronyms. Uh, so, for example, the FASTER acronym. Uh, so that's facial weakness, arm weakness, stability or unsteady gait, which is common with vertigo. Talking, so your slurred speech and difficult speech. And also your eyes involving your visual changes, and uh, such as diplopia and, and vision loss. Uh, so with that, I'll throw back over Timo and Alex uh, for some discussion about the, um, the international management. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, so I think, I um, think um, in terms in of terms the, uh, the Finnish side of things, um, I, I was looking into like obviously like differences in management of posterior stroke compared to like the like the traditional face arm speech type of like anterior stroke management and. The thing is, like, I, I didn't really find much at all in terms of the Finnish management. Um, obviously, in the hospital, um, the management is pretty much the same, just the results are varying. Um, but in the ambulance service, and even like talking with my colleagues at work, it's, it, it really goes back to what Harrison was saying about the um, posterior strokes being missed a lot of the times and not really even considered. So we don't really get taught like um, HINS exam and the, the five Ds that Harrison was talking about. And I, I think that's like a really big problem, really, because then it, it just ends up being missed completely. Um, and like from my personal experience and um, dealing with like these sorts of patients, I, I think it really boils down, down to like, um, unfortunately, like luck at the moment. So either the paramedic crew attending the patient is really lucky and they might spot a symptom mm -hmm. that they, that they feel, feel like, like be, be more, more of a traditional, traditional anterior, anterior stroke thing, thing, thing and then, and then they the patient, patient to a stroke centre or, 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 or like a ED will manage managing that, that as, as like an like anterior stroke, not that they really, they really think about the, the vessels that are being, being involved, involved in that thing. Or then, or then um, um, they end up, they end up pulling the patient, the patient just based just on the symptoms, symptoms that they have, they have um, um, kind of as, kind as, of as an unspecific type of situation um, to an ED that hopefully, yeah. and, and luckily mostly in Finland, is actually capable of starting treatment even for 
strokes and posterior strokes in 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 general so then the patient actually gets transferred but they they might not be properly diagnosed at the scene and uh, the burden falls on the hospital um obviously like everybody knows we can't see inside the head and most often um at least in finland we don't have any ways of doing ct on the field at least not at the moment um but still yeah, but like still like no no the same talking about talking about, about, about um, um, um disease, disease as a whole, as a whole and, uh, and uh, related, related, related to it it's 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 done it's direly direly lacking lacking missing, missing, missing in finland at the moment and that is really something to improve upon and I hope somebody from Finland is watching this because Harrison gave a really, really good opening to the whole posterior side of things and really opened some like really good symptoms to look out for. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's very true. And uh, it's pretty much the same here in the UK. And in Poland, where I was um, trained, we did not really put too much emphasis on, on, on posterior strokes. And... Uh, I completely agree, guys. Uh, it can be missed so many times that actually I believe that um, this podcast can be a, uh, an eye opener for our colleagues who uh, are now uh, attending, who may now um, who may now attend um, a patient with uh, unspecific uh, symptoms. Uh, I would refer our colleagues to nice guidelines um, I, I've got here again not much of a posterior stroke um, things uh, at hospital they are much better but first we uh, need to actually diagnose it or at least uh, put it in differential diagnosis uh, for other clinicians hospital clinicians to uh, consider um, thank you guys uh, I've got a surprise for our viewers and listeners uh, we've got one more paramedic from um, one more country um, ladies and gentlemen um, Gina uh, Wendy from uh, the US. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Gina LaRue Wendy. I'm with St. Louis, Missouri. It's the United States of America. Um, today I'm talking to you guys about posterior stroke slash CVA. Uh, in the United States, uh, in many different regions and states, they might use different stroke assessments per each state slash regional medical director. Here in St. Louis, I work for two ambulance companies, um, Abbott SCT, which is their critical care transport team. And then I also work for Christian EMS, which is in North County, St. Louis. We primarily use the Cincinnati Stroke Scale, or for those lay people, the FAST exam. So the Cincinnati Stroke Scale recognizes your face, and meaning asymmetry of the face and any facial droop when you smile. The next would be arms. In arms, we would supinate. We would hold up like your pizza and hold up a pizza and then clo- have them close their eyes and their arms would drift. So that would be a positive because of the arm weakness. Then it would be speech. You can teach an old dog new tricks is what they prefer because it uses the 18 cranial nerves. So then in St. Louis, we use Sunny Day in St. Louis because that also too uh, mimics the 18 cranial nerves. So what if you get to a scene and the the patient is completely 100% passes this exam, but they have this intense headache and you know something is wrong. Like you have this gut feeling that something else is going on. Maybe audio, they might have hallucinations with their ears or ringing in their ears or maybe visual, visual loss, something's going on, right? So we have another exam that we can perform. It's called our MEND exam and it's Miami Emergency Neurological Defect Pre-Hospital Exam. So with the MEND exam, you do the same FAST exam or your Cincinnati stroke scale, and then you add a little mix into it. So with that being said, you have visual clues. So now we're going to have them stare at our nose and we're going to use our peripherals to see if they could see either side. If they have any vision loss, that could be a clue as to what specific lobe is being affected by the stroke. 
Next is then we start using tactile, like using our finger to the nose as well, and then our arms and our legs. Um, so our legs, we're going to do a leg exam. It kind of looks like a grasshopper. You have your one leg touch the other's knee and then move it down to their ankle and then back up their knee. And same for the other leg. So the other leg would go to the other knee and down that, that lower leg and back up to that knee. And that would also tell us that if they have any type of lower um, motion movement that affects that part of the brain. Um, another thing is, is with recognition. Recognition here in the United States, they push for early recognition. As soon as you do that stroke exam is to go ahead and call that hospital. Also too, think about your rule out causes. Maybe hyper or hypoglycemia, maybe some type of thyroid problems or conditions, um, maybe Bell's palsy. Um, so we would like to take a, a blood sugar before we rule out any type of stroke like signs and symptoms. Um, also cluster headaches are a form of that, but cluster headaches also can lead to attributation to those same signs and symptoms of that posterior stroke slash CVA. Also, if it is a CVA or actual brain bleed in the posterior region, that's where all your your life-saving matters are. That That's your brain stem. So you have your reticulating activating system there, your medulla oblongata, things like that. So with that being said, their heart rate could be up there. Their blood pressure could be all over the place. They could have um, loss of control of their airway. They could have different heart rhythmias. So a herniation is some is very different in presenting than an actual stroke. But either way, that intense headache gives you that kind of clue. So early recognition is important to alert that hospital, hey, I need that CT table, I need a physician at the bedside during our arrival. Here in the United States, um, there are some few and far in between ambulance districts that do administer that clot busting drug. Unfortunately, here in St. Louis, and in the state of Missouri, there has not been uh, yet able to administer that TPA and as an emergency care provider. So I want you guys to have a great night and thank you very much for listening. Um, please stay safe out there. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. That was amazing. Uh, I really like this pizza thing. It's so American. Cool. Uh, guys, anything to add? Well, well, well yeah, yeah it's like, like um, I was thinking about, about what Gina said about, about um, um, hypoplasemia, like, like thinking, thinking back, back to, 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 to like, like training, training um, checking, checking for like, for like different, 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 different diagnoses, diagnoses and, and like, like remembering, remembering um, um, just like, like at the start, start of my studies, studies how I got really, really yelled at that for taking taking a patient to the EAD. Yes, yes, patient patient changes in with the stroke, like, like giving, giving a good hand out and then the nurse is like, um, um, but what's, what's the BM? BM? And I was like, well, actually, actually I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take it. They, they roll out the, the thing and they, they measure the patient's um, BM, find out it's 1.4. <laughs> and lo and behold, half an hour later, they walk out surviving the stroke. stroke. Or stroke. stroke. <laughs> um, well, 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 luckily, 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 I, I completely did and that's, that's like, a, like a really, really thing to remember, remember as well. As well. Just like, like, go through your, your differential as well. as well. And and I think that uh, you made a very fair, fair point, um, is going through differentials, but um, just put the things all the way around. If you, if you think um, that something weird is going with the patient, consider, um, uh, consider posterior stroke, because it, it, it's so difficult to, to catch in pre-hospital environment and you have so many um, weird or odd um, symptoms um, like for example um, ataxia and uh, contralateral ataxia I mean it's like 
what's actually going on here. Uh, Harrison? Yeah, look, as you guys discussed and um, as the video from Gina discussed as well, that that focusing on your differentials um, and your other causes is really important. Um, I luckily, unlike Timu, have not rolled up with a potential stroke uh, patient um, that's actually hypoglycemic yet, but I'm sure it will happen. It's a really easy, easy mistake uh, for paramedics and EMTs to make. Um, but I guess the only other thing I'll add is... Um, is something sort of quite quite novel and quite interesting that not a lot of services around the world are actually employing at the moment, uh, but it seems to be a growing growing area of research, um, and that's that's mobile stroke ambulances. So there's only a couple of them around the world. Um, in the southern hemisphere, uh, where I reside, there's only two of them. So there's one in uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina, um, and the other one here in, in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, so they're purpose-built ambulances uh, that are staffed by usually a paramedic crew, uh, but also a stroke nurse and a neurologist as well. But the key thing that these ambulances have that other ambulances do not uh, is a mobile CT scanner um, to make uh, the diagnosis and, and treatment of stroke patients a lot earlier. Um, so there was a paper from, uh, from Zhao et al, um, that analyzed the first 365 days of the Melbourne mobile stroke unit, um, and, and it's efficacy, efficacy as well. So in that time, there was a hundred patients that were from the lives. So nice round, round, round number, number one, one year, year pretty good. good. Um, but of, of those hundred patients, patients, the average or the median, median time, time saving, saving um, from dispatch to from the lives was 42.5 minutes, minutes oh, wow. compared, compared to the control, control group, group, which is, which is yeah, yeah, really, really, really impressive. So the way this particular trial is run is this ambulance based out of one of the major metropolitan hospitals that comes in stroke screener in Melbourne. Um, um, and it was responding, responding typically, typically um, in a 30-kilometre 30 30 30 km radius, radius from, from that hospital, hospital. Um, and was, was operating, operating on Monday Friday, Friday during business, business hours, because that's, that's obviously the only time, time that people have strokes. Have strokes. <laughs> uh, but no, no, that's, no, that's just when, when this was uh, running for the for the trial period. So, yeah, a median uh, time saving of 42.5 minutes is awesome. Um, 41 of those patients, 41 of those 100 patients went on to receive endovascular thrombectomy, so clot retrieval therapy. Um, and there was median dispatch to treatment time in those patients of 51 minutes. So identifying those patients that are um, obviously suitable for the thrombolytics, but also suitable for that clot retrieval. Um, and here where I work, and I'm sure a lot of other places around the world, not all stroke centres, not all um, hospitals capable of caring for a stroke patient can do endovascular thrombectomy as well. So it's identifying those patients that are suitable for that higher level of care and perhaps bypassing other suitable hospitals to um, to get to that um, definitive care. Um, so they had an estimated disability adjusted life years, so your delis. Um, estimated life years saved through earlier interventions through that time saving uh, was 20.9 years for thrombolysis and 24.6 years for those 41 patients that got the clot retrieval. Um, so really, really good results there. Um, but that in itself was a reasonably small study, so only 100 patients in that one. Um, but actually earlier today, um, on the 9th of September that we are today, there's a study pub uh, published rather in the New England Journal of Medicine um, by Grotter and others. Um, and that was titled Prospective Multi-Center multi -center, rather, Controlled Trial of uh, Mobile, mobile stroke stroke So they, so they had a lot more patients, patients involved. involved. There, there is 1,515 patients, patients enrolled in that trial. In that trial. Uh, there's, there's a medium, medium time, time from, from stroke, stroke onset, onset to thrombolysis, thrombolysis for 108 minutes with the, with the standard EMS, EMS care, care, so you can take them to the hospital. hospital. 108 minutes, yeah, compared, compared to 72 minutes, minutes, minutes from the from mobile, mobile stroke, stroke so a medium, medium saving, saving uh, of about 36 minutes, minutes, minutes is really, really, really good. good. And, and roughly consistent with what we found here in Melbourne. So 55% of the patients in the stroke unit group had modified ranking scores of 0 to 1 at 90 days compared to 44.4% in the standard care group. Um, so for those that aren't aware, the Rankin score is a measure of basically neurological disability um, after a stroke and is essentially an indicator of, of, um, of function. Um, the mortality at 90 days was also improved as well. So mortality of 8.9% at 90 days in the MSU group compared to 11.9% in the AMS group. So in the um, 
patient cohort uh, improvement of, of 2% um, 90 day mortality, which is really good. So as I said before, there's not many of these units around the world that are available. I think there's one, um, there's a couple in, in America. I think there's one in, in Oslo. So not too far from where you are, team. Again, my geography is terrible. terrible. Um, and, and as I said, only two down, down in the southern hemisphere. hemisphere. Uh, hemisphere. So, so hopefully, hopefully as, as, as years go on, on as the... Um, as funding and as research improves in this area, hopefully there is more of these rolled out so we can, we can see some better patient outcomes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Like, um, I think in terms of like um, Finland with like 5.6 million people residing in a fairly large area, I think the difficulty of actually implementing something like that here is obviously the cost versus the benefit. So even even though shrug is really common, it's still less in like actual numbers here than Melbourne, for example. I think Melbourne has more strokes per year than the whole of Finland, um, which is good for us, <laughs> uh, but still. So actually recently um, they started, like there's six helicopters in Finland and the one in um, Tampere is actually now starting to convey patients from from the area to the university hospital in the city if they meet the criteria for um, thrombectomy. And they actually managed to reduce the, the time to treatment by like maybe like 20 minutes or something. They only had like 23 patients in the in the short period that they actually were looking into it more precisely. And they and they were managed to do some really good things with those patients. So I, I think that's really picking up um, and it's going to be picked up by the other helicopters in Finland as well. So then there's going to be a doctor transporting the patient um, and there's no need for the, the ground crews to do the long trip to the hospital with, with the patient. patient. That's um, potentially um, even at risk of complications on the way to the hospital and managing that on a moving truck is as anyone can imagine, more very fun. Uh, a few years uh, we had here in, in the UK, we had a big campaign on uh, sepsis, and I wish we had something like that now, um, just building this this awareness of the posterior stroke. Because again, w- we just we just proven that uh, it can be missed so easily, and those patients can actually not get the best care they deserve uh just letting you know guys that um all the uh, references will be later on put on the description to the video and the video uh, will be available on uh, the www.groupcall.uk we also are working uh, hard to actually get the audio to um to the uh, podcast uh, platforms uh, but we will uh, keep you posted and definitely either on Facebook, uh, Instagram, or on our um, web page, you will see an update uh, where uh, you can access not only the video recording, but also audio. Um, last thing, guys, anything to add? Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'd just like to ask um, I think um, sepsis, um, MI, um, like resuscitation, like cardiac arrest, they've been like big themes around the world in different services in the past 10 years. And um, I, th- I think we're getting to that point where stroke, be it anterior, posterior, um, is, is gonna come and be a theme as well. And that's that's really good. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward, forward to, 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 to like, um, like um, picking up, picking up some, traction some traction and, and more studies, more studies on, that, on like, that, like really good really studies, studies that Harrison, Harrison pointed, out, pointed out, out and um, new, um, new management, management problem because, problem because at, the, at the moment, at the moment especially, especially like, the, like the, the pre-hospital, pre-hospital diagnosing, diagnosing the tools, the that, tools we have, that we have, they really, they really do some improvement. improvement. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to it. Harrison? Yeah, and I think, yeah, and we, I think we, we look at the look at the, um, the, um, the, diff- the difficulty around the stroke as well. I mean, you you look where um, cardiac care and, and STEMI care was um, 20 years ago compared to where it is now, um, and that's developed quite a lot. Uh, but with stroke, you know, we don't have an ECG for the brain pre-hospital. We don't have a troponin for the brain pre-hospital. It, it's our our diagnosis, our provisional diagnosis is based purely on clinical findings and 
um, and relying on us not not missing some of those um, sometimes really subtle subtle cues. Um, but for those out there listening, um, you know, don't be too hard on yourself for missing these posterior strokes because, as I said earlier, they are missed in hospital quite a lot. Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to, you know, sit back and go, oh, you know, let's let's just not improve. There's definitely ways, there's definitely ways improve, 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 improve our recognition of these and, 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 and hopefully lead to better patient outcomes. Yeah, and uh, that would be uh, my message to all our viewers and listeners. Guys, please keep your eyes open but also keep your minds open. Uh, the fact that patient is presented with uh, unusual clinical features, unusual signs and symptoms, uh, can actually mean that it is a posterior stroke. Um, and as uh, Harrison rightly said at the beginning, uh, the anatomy of the posterior artery and its branches uh, causes that the symptoms can be actually uh, unusual and it, it's not like a closed um, uh, closed uh, list of symptoms hence why uh, as a clinician you should keep your eyes and um, a, a mind open and just think posterior stroke don't only think sepsis and I'm talking to my British colleagues uh, don't only think sepsis also think posterior stroke build up your differential diagnosis and uh, the last thing is i don't know guys how it is in uh, australia and finland but here um there is i'm not saying that everyone but there is an agenda saying oh actually i will just take them to hospital and hospital will find out not always uh clinicians at hospital will find out because remember about this unconscious bias if you are if you are handing over the patient saying oh i think uh it's just whatever i don't know substance abuse or 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 or, 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 or mental health issue or, or anything else the, the receiving clinician may actually build the diagnosis they direct diagnosis on your diagnosis um mm-hmm. is, is, isn't isn't it guys yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Yeah, that diagnostic, diagnostic momentum, momentum is really, is really important. important. So, so um, yeah, keep keeping very mindful of, of how you hand over patients, and um, and yeah, making sure that you're not starting the hospital off on the wrong foot, and, and making sure you're you're advocating for your patient is really important. Cool, guys. Thank you so much, uh, Harrison. Uh, that was your topic. That was the topic you 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 uh, brought up to the table. Uh, thank you so much for a really good background, Timu. Uh, thank you also for for amazing input, uh, ladies and gents. Um, that was the first ever uh, episode of Group Call Live, first international paramedic podcast hosted by paramedics from three different countries. Uh, we will be back soon with um, next interesting topic, and uh, we will keep you posted where and how we will see you guys thank you so much for watching cheers guys thanks guys thanks guys thank you thank you my name is alex hepner and this was group call live